Hi there, this is Rupert Shapiro with the Dr. Vax channel, and it's time to show some love to my Prusa i3 MK3. We're going to do two upgrades, and then we're going to test them with a variety of filaments. The first is I have a Olsen Ruby nozzle here. So we're going to put some jewels on this uh, Prusa. The Ruby nozzle is unique in that it can be used with any material. It's very resilient to wear. So theoretically, it's a nozzle for life. Uh, we'll talk about the pros and cons of the Ruby nozzle in uh, a few minutes. In addition, I have a brand new Matter Hackers spring steel powder coated print bed sheet for this Prusa. I'm really excited to give this a try. Um, I was printing some inexpensive multicolor fil filament. It was PLA, should not be a problem, but it stuck to my uh, print surface too hard and literally pulled off some of the print sheet on this side of my original Prusa print bed. So I'm interested to try this new Matter Hacker powder coated uh, pr spring steel plate because the powder coated plates from Prusa are hard to get um, and I received this in two days. So stay tuned and let's learn something together. Let me walk you through the procedure we're going to follow, and then I'm gonna move the camera, zoom in, and you can watch how I replace the nozzle. The first step in replacing the nozzle is to heat up the print core, uh, heat up the printer. And the reason is that metal expands when it's heated, and so the threads on the nozzle will be tighter when they're cool. The second reason is that if there's any filament left in around the nozzle, when you heat it up, it will become liquefied and that will also make it easier to get the nozzle out. So the first step is we're gonna heat up the nozzle. So when you have a 3D filament-based printer, your filament goes through a cool area called a heat break into a hot area and then to the print surface. There's a fan to cool the filament on the print surface, and there's a fan to cool the heat break or the area within the extruder mechanism that um, is above the hot area. We're going to take off this orange shroud that will let us gain access to the nozzle. Then, I'm very fortunate. I was at the Midwest RepRap uh, conference last weekend uh, in Indiana, and the people from Olsen Ruby were there. I mentioned I had purchased a nozzle, I was going to make a video about inserting it, and they gave me a brand new tool that they're going to begin shipping. Uh, they indicated that Matter Hackers here in the States will be uh, carrying this. This is a mini torque wrench that can be used for taking off and replacing a nozzle, and it will make sure you don't over torque or over tighten the nozzle. Because if you over tighten the nozzles, you'll strip the threads, then you have to replace your whole hot end. Okay, so we're going to heat up the hot end, we're going to take off the fan shroud, we're going to remove the old nozzle, we're going to put in the new nozzle, and then we will do some test prints. Since I'm working on this while I'm heating up the hot end, I have to be very, very careful. careful. I'm going to use a 2.5 millimeter hex wrench to remove the screw that holds this orange piece of plastic which redirects the fan. So we will remove that carefully and put that aside. And now you can see we have access to the nozzle. Um, the nozzle on the hot end, the hot end on the nozzle needs to be held while you're removing the nozzle so you do not break the hot end. And so I'm going to use here a rigid robo grip. I find that works very well. There are wires on the left side of the nozzle. You do not want to touch those, they're very fragile. So you can hold this with this robo grip on the front and back carefully. And then I'm going to use the nozzle tool here 
to remove the nozzle. And we now have the nozzle removed. Let me put that in a safe place because it is hot. It is important that you remove the nozzle from the torque tool right away. Once it cools, if there's any plastic on there, um, it will make it more difficult to remove. Then I'm going to put the new ruby nozzle into the torque screw tool. I'm going to get it threaded just a little bit, very slightly. I'm not going to put any torque on it until I am holding the heat brake. So let me just screw it until it's literally barely finger tight. There we go. Now once again I'm going to hold the heat brake. The hot end actually, the heat brake is above this with this robo grip. And I'm going to torque this until I get one click. There we go. And we are ready to go. Okay, now that the Ruby nozzle is in place, we need to recalibrate the printer. Because not only are we going to have a new Ruby nozzle, but we're also going to have a new print surface. So the first thing is to make sure the proximity sensor is in the proper position. Um, you want it to be just slightly above the height of the um, bottom of the nozzle. If it's too high up, you risk running the nozzle into the print bed, which could damage the nozzle. So we, I adjusted the proximity uh, sensor. In this case, there's a screw on the side that you loosen and then you turn the sensor. I needed to lower it just a drop for this printer. Now I'm going to use the front panel in order to go through the initial calibration. Um, each printer is different. In the case of the Prusa, I'm going to start with the actual wizard and go through all steps of the calibration to make sure the printer is calibrated properly. When that's completed, we'll come back and we'll do our first prints. Okay, a couple observations so far. Uh, first, I changed two things at the same time. Probably not a good idea. I changed the nozzle and I changed the print surface. And therefore, it took me quite a bit of time to recalibrate uh, this printer. Um, the first time I went to run the calibration, I had the proximity sensor set too high and the nozzle actually hit the sheet of paper. Uh, you could tell because if you went to move the sheet of paper, it was pinned down, immediately turned off the printer lowered the proximity sensor. I had to do that twice to get that right. Then when doing my first layer calibration, and you can see that um, here on the printer, right here, I also had to run this a number of times. There were a couple things that were interesting about this. The first is that using the original brass nozzle and the original print surface, I had a Z offset, a live Z offset of minus 650. With this setup, the live Z aux offset in order to get a really nice first print was minus a thousand. Um, and the second thing is that because this is a textured surface, when looking at the individual lines of the first layer calibration, um, they look very different um, because you're actually pressing them a bit into the textured surface. Okay, that's behind us now. And finally, I'm ready to set up for the first print. We'll be back in just a bit. Okay, I'm back. Different shirt, different day. In fact, a number of days have passed since we initially installed the Ruby nozzle in our Prusa i3 MK3. It takes a bit of time to calibrate a printer properly. It also takes a bit of time just to print a, a variety of samples. Um, the calibration process did not go completely smoothly, and the quality wasn't what I expected initially. Um, I have resolved all that. There's a link in the corner to a video that talks about that process and a problem I had with the Optilapse plugin for OptiPrint. The Optilapse pl plugin inserts G-code into your printer stream and 
on a layer shift moves the printer head to a standard position so that you get a, a nicer time-lapse video. That, however, impacts the print because when you're moving that nozzle, it takes time, the layer cools off a little bit, and it impacts the print and the layer quality. So that's all resolved. I've disabled that plugin for right now, and we can look at quality. Overall, no difference. The brass nozzle and the ruby nozzle produce the exact same quality at the exact same layer heights. Now, I printed almost exclusively at a 0.2 millimeter layer height, and I did find one general difference. For filaments that print at lower temperatures, such as PLA, I had to increase the temperature both for the initial layer and for subsequent layers by about 7 degrees Celsius. So by just boosting the temperature by 70 degrees Celsius, I didn't change anything else. I experimented with changing fans and fan speed and, and uh, when the fan comes on. None of that seemed to have an impact, but increasing the temperature did. So initially, I printed some Marvins. Uh, these are in Hatchbox PLA. Um, I'm a big fan of Hatchbox PLA. It's an inexpensive, easy-to-get filament. And they were printed at an initial layer temperature, believe it or not, of 222 degrees Celsius, and subsequent layers at 217. So relatively hot for PLA. Now you have to remember, these temperatures are for this printer. Every printer is different because the thermistors are not necessarily fully calibrated. So your printer might read a little hotter or a little cooler than my printer. Uh, but these came out very nice. Next, I printed this really beautiful model. This is in Matter Hackers. They're uh, Matter Hackers, uh, I believe it's called the Build Filament. I printed this at the same temperatures, at 222 and 217. Um, I believe that the layer lines are, in fact, here I'll show you in a close-up, I think the layer lines are a bit better, even in this print, and the Hatchbox was very good. Um, but I printed this specifically because I wanted to test whether there was any imprint impact on tolerances, and there were not. Uh, this articulated model uh, worked perfectly, came right off the print bed. The next thing I tried was wood fill filament. And I had to try a number of experiments to get the temperatures right. This was printed at the wrong temperature. In fact, this print was before I found the Optilapse issue. But um, the wood fill uh, filament, I found you had to, and this is Color Fab wood. I printed it at 217, 212. So cooler than the PLA. Uh, when you print it as hot as the PLA, uh, it, uh, first of all, it smells like burning wood, which is not necessarily bad. It's a very pleasant smell. But I was concerned about nozzle um, blockages. And uh, those are caused if the wood starts to burn at all in the nozzle, it will cause debris to form in the nozzle. So you want to keep the temperature as low as possible while hot enough to get a good print. So when I did get the temperature calibrated properly, I printed this beautiful handle for a knife. Um, there is writing on here that happens to be Hebrew writing that says have a good Sabbath, Shabbat Shalom. You could put any writing you want. I will link to this model uh, in the notes, uh, both a blank one, one of Hebrew writing and one of English writing. Um, and I then stained this with traditional wood-based stain it is a polystain uh, compound that both adds protection and a color. There are two coats of stain on here. This is, here I'll show you a close up here. This is absolutely gorgeous, absolutely gorgeous. The next one I tried was the Color Fab bronze filled um, material. Uh, interestingly enough, I had to print that at a lower temperature. Um, I printed that at 215, 210, 215 for the initial layer. When I printed it hotter than that, it got way too stringy and too soft, um, and it caused the layers not to form properly. Uh, a hypothesis based on some Googling is that the bronze uh, filaments that are in this, uh, the bronze 
uh, fibers that are in this filament cause it to hold temperature a little bit better. Um, I did polish this afterwards with steel wool and a little bit of actually plastic polish that I use for polishing pens. Um, it came out really quite beautiful and it is interesting that it feels about twice the weight of the wood filled um, sample. Both these were printed at a fill of 50% um, in order to give them some bulk. Then, I next, I printed a high temperature filament. This is Colorfab XT. Uh, this is the clear. I printed it at 260, 270. And while not really clear, it looks absolutely, I'll show you here close up, it looks absolutely uh, like ice. It is a beautiful, beautiful filament. Um, and it gives you this sort of crystal ice look and that printed very successfully. And then finally, uh, one of my favorite filaments are the CC3D China filaments. I buy these on Amazon. They're available in a variety of colors. This is what they call their rainbow color, which is really a, um, a variety of greens and yellows and golds uh, melded together. Um, and you really can't see the separate colors uh, clearly, maybe it's the nature of this model, but this is an absolutely gorgeous print. So in summary, I was able to print with a ruby nozzle all of the standard print filaments I print with identical quality and much more exotic filaments. Now the wood fil filament you can print on a brass novel nozzle. It's not viewed as abrasive. Um, the bronze filament you would need to use a hardened nozzle. Um, and depending on your uh, printer, uh, the ColorFab XT may be too high of a temperature. To wrap up, the tools I think are really important for this is I love using this RoboGrip. It's a rigid tool from RoboGrip. You can uh, buy them at Home Depot. I assume you can buy them online. If you can, I'll put a link in there. And I use the Olsen Ruby tool, which is a torque wrench specifically designed to give you the right torque for this nozzle. Um, it's probably the right torque for most nozzles, so I would highly recommend that. Okay, I hope you learned something today, or actually you learned something from my experience over the last week or so. If you did, give me a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel. More importantly, leave me comments about things you find are interesting. I highly recommend these ColorFab filaments. I'll leave links in the notes um, and um, both the filled filament and the XT filament are gorgeous filaments. For everyday printing, I like this Matter Hackers um, basic filament. I found it was very, very easy to print and reduced the layer lines uh, just a bit. They don't call it basic, they call it Matter Hacker build. Thanks so much, have a great day, let's continue to learn things together.